All right, let's talk a little bit briefly about sigma and pi bonds. Um, these are ways to label bonds in molecules based on where the electrons are being shared in the molecule. So let's start with a sigma bond. A sigma bond, and you can draw the symbol sigma or write out the word sigma, a sigma bond is a bond in which the pair of electrons is shared directly between the two atoms. Now you might say, well, aren't the electrons always shared directly between the two atoms? And the answer is no, they're not, or else we wouldn't distinguish this. But a sigma bond is a bond in which the electrons are shared directly between the two atoms. If you have a single bond, that is a bond made up of a pair of electrons, that single bond is a sigma bond, and that pair of electrons is shared directly between the two atoms. Now if you have a um, and that's what a sig sigma bond is. It is a bond in which the electrons are shared directly between the atoms, and a single bond is indeed a sigma bond. The other type of bond that we want to look at is a pi bond, and again you can draw the symbol for it. And in a pi bond, the electrons are shared above and below the plane of the atoms. Now this sounds kind of weird, and it's very difficult for me to draw, so I'm going to tell you to go look at pictures of pi bonds. Um, but basically, recall that all of the orbitals we looked at in a previous chapter, some of the orbitals extend above and below the nucleus, and so a pi bond shares electrons in orbitals that are above and below the nucleus and are overlapping with orbitals on other atoms that are above and below the nucleus. And so uh, a pi bond is a bond in which the electrons are shared above and below the plane of the atoms. If you have a double bond, a double bond is made up of two pairs of electrons. The very first pair of electrons in a double bond is in a sigma bond. One pair of electrons of the two pairs of electrons in a double bond are shared directly between the atoms and they are in a sigma bond. They're overla overlapping orbitals between the atoms. The second pair of electrons in a double bond are shared in a pi bond. They overlap above and below the plane of the atoms. They're not in the same space as the two electrons in the sigma bond. Again, please go look at some pictures of these. You can find them in your textbook. You can also find them if you Google them. If you have a triple bond, a triple bond is made up of three pairs of electrons. One pair of electrons is in a sigma bond directly between the two atoms that have the triple bond. A second pair of electrons are in a pi bond above and below the plane of the atoms just like they were in the double bond. The third pair of electrons in a triple bond are in an additional pi bond in front and behind the plane of the atoms. Well, if you twist it 90 degrees, you are back to being above and below, so we don't need to change the definition. Again, go take a, take a look at a picture of a triple bond in terms of the overlap of the orbitals, and you will see the sigma, the pi, and the pi. So a single bond is a sigma bond made up of a sigma bond. A double bond contains both a sigma and a pi, and a triple bond contains a sigma and two pi bonds. So that sort of defines where the electrons are. Next, we want to talk about where the electrons are in terms of the or orbitals that are overlapping. For that discussion, we're going to talk about the theory that includes hybridization. Now, when something hybridizes, it's like two things combined to make something new. That's what hybridization is. And that is the theory behind what's happening for the orbitals on an atom in order to form bonds with other atoms within a molecule. And so what we look at is we look at the central atom, and we can talk about that central atom and what his hybridization would have to be based on what molecule he's forming. Let me go ahead and get some space here and we'll continue this. Um, the theory of hybridization says that that central atom has in its valence level an s orbital and three p orbitals. We can think of them in terms of an orbital diagram. There would be some electrons in here, however many electrons that valence uh, were in the valence shell. I could have drawn lines for this. I could have drawn circles for this. And so for example, let's take carbon. Carbon's valence electron level 
is the n equals 2, and he has 2s2, 2p2. That is his valence level electron configuration. That means he has two electrons in his s orbital and two electrons in his p orbitals, and we know from previous chapters that they're going to go in individual orbitals spinning the same direction. Now, if carbon forms a molecule, he's typically the central atom, and what the theory of hybridization says is that he takes some or all of these orbitals in his valence level, he smushes them together, and out pops hybrid orbitals, and the type of hybrid orbitals he produces from those depends on how many of these he, he uses to produce them, and, but ultimately on how many he needs to form the molecule that he is in. So let's start a little table that picks up where we learned last on geometries. In order to identify geometries, we needed to know the number of electron groups, and that directly gave us the electron geometry. For, for example, if there are two electron groups, the electron geometry is linear. If there are three electron groups, the electron geometry is trigonal planar. Let me finish filling this out really quickly. All right, so this is something that we've learned before. Now what the, th the theory that we're talking about says is that in order for carbon to form a linear arrangement, if there are only two groups around him, he needs to form hybrid orbitals that point 180 degrees from each other, because that's what a linear arrangement gives us. Well, in order to do that, he needs to take an s orbital and a p orbital. He'll take this one and one of those, not all three of them, and he will smush them together, and out will pop two hybrid orbitals, and we call those each of those hybrid orbitals an sp hybrid orbital. And it's a set of two, because he needs two for his two electron groups. He has some remaining p orbitals that can be used to form overlaps above and below the plane of the atoms that he's uh, forming a bond with, in other words, for a double bond or a triple bond. So if there are only two groups around the central atom, you're going to have a sigma bond directly between the carbon and each of the groups he's forming the bond with, each of the two groups. The sigma bond is formed from the hybrid orbital, and the remaining p orbitals form overlap above and below the plane. They give you the p orbitals. All right, if I have a central atom that has three groups around the center, we learned previously that that needs a trigonal planar arrangement. Well, how does that happen? The central atom takes an s and two of his p orbitals. He takes an s, a p, and a second p. Notice that leaves a leftover p, and he forms three sp2 hybrids. That's the name of each of those hybrid orbitals. This is a set of three. And he does this so that he can point to the, the, the positions of the trigonal planar. Let me go through the rest of these quickly because the pattern is exactly the same. If the central atom needs a tetrahedral arrangement because he has four electron groups, he takes his s and all three of his p orbitals, sp3, forms four hybrid orbitals and that is a set of four that point to the, the positions of the tetrahedron. Now once we get to the trigonal bipyramid, you must be thinking to yourself, okay, we're out of p orbitals. What am I going to use to get my fifth? Well, recall that we can only have five electron groups if it's an expanded octet. Expanded octets are only present when you have d orbitals. So this guy is going to take his s, all three of his p's, and then he's going to go grab an empty d orbital in his valence level to form the trigonal bipyramid. And to stop beating dead horses, here we have if he needs six, he's going to grab his s, all three of his p's, two of his d's, and form six sp3 d2 hybrid orbitals, that's a set of six, to point to the corners of the octahedron. So that is how we decide what hybrid orbitals are formed. It is totally based on the number of electron groups around the central atom, which gives us our electron geometry, and it follows directly from that. I hope this helps.